Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Ken Berger, President and CEO of Charity Navigator, the world's largest and most utilized evaluator of charities. The organization works to guide intelligent giving through an unbiased, objective, numbers-based rating system and has assessed more than 8,000 charities worldwide. Ken has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Ken, for joining us today. My pleasure. So let's start off with a, with a very controversial topic, evaluation of charities, using numbers to assess whether a charity is having a positive impact and to what extent that, that impact is positive. Talk about evaluation, the pitfalls and benefits. Well, I think it gets back to the origins of the organization and the intent behind it. I think the founder's view was that there, at the time, they didn't see any place where the general public could go to get analytics. A foundation has a program officer that can go into a deep dive. Experts can uh, review 990s and, and so forth. But to have a place for people to go that sort of uh, summarizes the best of what we can pull together. I think the struggle for any organization that does this kind of evaluation is a never-ending balancing act between scale, having an adequate number of organizations that reach the needs for people, and depth, having adequate depth, and I think that's really the heart of your question, having adequate depth that is uh, meaningful and that actually addresses some of the unique features of each organization you're considering. It's a never-ending struggle. There's no easy answer to that. Anything that we come up with hopefully is continuously improved. In the case of Charity Navigator, we started with seven metrics when we began, and we've moved from seven to 39. So when it comes to depth, there's that. Scale, we started with about 1,000 charities. We're now up to 8,000. These 8,000 charities get about 55% of all uh, private contributions made in the United States each year. So um, we are increasingly trying to customize. We are increasingly trying to go to the program level in what we look at. We are increasingly trying to dialogue with the charities, to survey them, to have their unique answers. And the models we're using are increasingly, you tell us uh, what you think makes the most sense when it comes to some of the new measures. And uh, we use reasonable person standard, a common sense standard, because some of the things we're now looking at, there are no yet agreed upon standards. Cherry Navigator has attempted to listen to its critics, perhaps not to completely satisfy. And we, we have the, the issue with US News and uh, World Report being criticized for their evaluation of colleges. Yeah. Any evaluator is going to be criti criticized to some extent, and justifiably so, but you have tried to to shift your, your metrics in response. Talk about how that shift has worked and, and how the metrics that you currently use are more textured, provide a better uh, window into a, a, a nonprofit organization's um, effectiveness. Maybe I can answer that in part through the genesis of how, it, how I experienced it. I, you know, I came from running uh, nonprofits uh, for about 30 years before I came to Charity Navigator. So my experience was really doing the direct service and being there on the front lines. And when I came to Charity Navigator, my knowledge of uh, metrics and, and ratings was somewhat limited. But my charge by the founders when I came to Charity Navigator was in part to convert us from a private foundation to a public charity. And that also meant, whereas in the past, there was no need for fundraising, that I needed to raise funds. And so within a few months, I went and I began to reach out to foundations. And in the beginning, uh, that criticism was quite uh, intense. And so I then went on a listening tour and came back to the founders and I said, we need to make some changes to the rating system. There's some serious concerns out there I think we need to listen to. And to the founders' credit, uh, uh, the, the, the Pat Dugan was, uh, the, the, is the guy who really was a key visionary. He said, great, uh, I think you're right. I consider the things you're talking about the holy grail. We just didn't know that we would be able to take that path. We, didn't, we thought we could only use certain proxies. So let's talk about how your previous experience had informed your approach to, to, um, to evaluation but as a nonprofit leader, not as charity navigator, as a yeah. nonprofit leader? Well, I started out uh, 
actually I was still in uh, graduate school at the time and I was, w one of my first positions was the executive director of a homeless shelter in uh, New Jersey. I was in a very small nonprofit and I got to see everything from sweeping the floors and feeding homeless people, because uh, that was the nature of our, our work, to dealing with the media, to developing a budget, to negotiating contracts with uh, government entities and general fundraising with the public. That was like how I started. So building a program, from, and also building it from scratch, it didn't exist. So I had to create all the policies and the procedures for a brand new organization that hadn't existed before. And they'd been trying to open it for years and had tremendous public resistance to it. And it was a consortium of uh, faith-based organizations of all, all different religions and uh, creeds. And so uh, that momentum, that starting point really uh, shaped my thinking on, you know, that was where I cut my teeth on, on how to run a nonprofit. So I was thrust almost immediately into a management level role. I mean, I was also doing case management and screening uh, clients coming in, but very small nonprofit and the challenges of a small nonprofit and uh, with all these different uh, requirements, that was the beginning. So when I came to Charity Navigator and I started to study the sector from the higher level, I came to this realization that I never knew, and I think a lot of people in the sector may have some sense of, but not to the extent that I came to realize it. I, I sometimes tongue in cheek call it the Occupy Charity problem. Mm -hmm. That 1% of the charities in the United States garner 86% of the resources, the $2 trillion that comes into the sector each year, and that the sector has what's called the long, long, long tail. And that virtually half of all nonprofits are, let's say, 50,000 or less. And so that first experience is the norm, if you will, in terms of the number of organizations that are out there. And the other thing that that also is very profoundly experiencing for me to this very day is that I find that a lot of the conversations within the nonprofit sector are driven by, are within that 1% uh, because, uh, for a variety of reasons, one of them being the resources and the time to do it. <clears throat> and so a lot of times we'll come up with solutions and ideas for how the sector should move forward that are at this level when in fact on the ground in the trenches, its applicability is extremely limited. And so teasing out, how do we take these many great ideas uh, and great thinkers, but how do we take that and really apply it to these very humble small organizations with limited resources, I think is a big, big challenge that I've seen at Charity Navigator and even in our system. How do you, how do you customize this and have realistic expectations. In terms of the, uh, the the scope of Charity Navigator's operations, the competencies that you recruit into the organization, describe describe Charity Navigator as an organization as you would, for example, in a, in a, in a, in a uh, case from your MBA days. Our, our core mission is to serve donors and to provide them the best information we can for them to make the optimal decision to help nonprofits that are doing the greatest work. And a secondary mission I can't underemphasize, and we've increasingly moved in this direction, is to educate and advocate for nonprofits themselves to help them to become high performing. And that complements the primary mission because the more high performing nonprofits there are, there are more places we can point people to. So it's a sort of a virtuous cycle if it works right. And so within that, the website is our core operation as a vehicle to fulfill that mission. And then the secondary, in addition to the website, is thought leadership to speak out. And so thank you for helping me fulfill the <laughs> second part of the mission. So you have a, a team of people to develop the website yeah. and to continue to evolve it. Um, how does that look? How, how yeah. many people do you have as part of Charity Navigator? Well, uh, currently we have uh, 20 uh, full-time positions. Um, a number of them are vacant right now. We're hiring for a few of them at the moment. Um, and we hope to get to uh, 28 positions. So we're small. Uh, that was one of the things that blew my mind when I came, the influence. I mean, I, I was asked to speak in Russia, in China. I'm sitting across from Anderson Cooper. And I'm like, we're, we're a relatively small organization. But the power of the internet and what we're doing is just phenomenal. But yes, we have a, an IT department. We have a uh, fundraising department. Uh, we have a marketing and communications department because of all of the uh, 
relations we have with the media and public speaking and all that. But the biggest department of all is the evaluation department. And that is um, over half the staff is the evaluation department. Um, and so that essentially uh, are, are the functional areas. Um, we are in the midst of, a, a right now, of scaling up the operation. Uh, we went through a strategic business planning process, and so we're trying to double our size as we deep go, as we've been migrating from seven to 39 metrics, and as we've been going from 5,000 charities when I started to 10,000, hopefully by the end of next year, um, we're trying to build up the operation. And so all of the challenges that I'm sure you're familiar with of scaling up uh, within a nonprofit environment, uh, we face those uh, challenges. Although the nonprofit sector is populated by so many people who have passion, who have goodwill, who are careful, and who are extremely skilled at, at delivering value from very, very scarce resources, there are also the scoundrels and thieves that we need, where we need to protect the sector yes. and others from those. Talk about Charity Navigator's work in that area. Well, and, and, and I, I have to just premise, uh, preface that by giving you a, a very fast uh, summary of my experience. Of the uh, six or seven nonprofits I worked in before Charity Navigator, uh, in almost half of them, the leadership uh, fell into the category of scoundrels and thieves. People lying, people lining their pockets, people who are much more driven by uh, organization priority rather than mission manipulation. I, I, I could go on for days, but I won't. But it did get me to a point in my career where I, I had this sort of why me kind of experience. And then when I came to Charity Navigator, it was like, oh, now I see. And uh, part of the role of Charity Navigator is to call out those scoundrels and thieves. And we have something called the donor advisory system, where when we identify organizations that are having a major governmental investigation, a lawsuit related to fraud and embezzlement, and so on, we are uh, identifying that. And it's quite controversial. It causes us a lot of uh, pushback. But uh, one of the things that that shaped in my dialogue with a lot of the experts out there is a lot of uh, nonprofit experts will say, the frequency of scoundrels and thieves, my term, in the sector is rare. And I'm not saying it is commonplace, but I think to say that it's rare de-emphasizes the problem. And there is a tendency in the culture of the nonprofit sector to sort of duck and cover. You don't want to offend anybody, and you don't want, and there's a fear if you bring to light too much this stuff, it's going to damage the public trust. It's going to make people say, well, if I can't, if they're doing that over there, who's this, you know, this over here? So every time I speak to a reporter, because most of the time they'll want to talk to us about the scoundrels and thieves, my, I hammer home, please don't let this be the entirety of your story. Please make sure you insert in that story the incredibly wonderful, dedicated people that are doing amazing work. Balance out the story. Um, so. I think that we need, as a sector, to become more outspoken about those situations when they occur because, yeah, it may damage some trust in the short term, but if we get ahead of it and if we speak out on it and if we're more aggressive about it, I think in the longer term it'll be to the benefit of all of us and it will increase public trust. So how do you defend yourself ag against the inevitable fallout from uh, criticism or from designations that you, that you might assign to, to people who are those, as you say, scoundrels and thieves? Well, I, I want to be clear that not everybody on that list is necessarily fit into the class of a scoundrel or a thief. Um, there are some situations where it turns out that at the end of the investigation they are not found guilty, for example. And so this advisory is saying to donors, you might want to keep this in mind. You might want to pause until we see how this works out. Um, so I just want to be clear on that. But I think we try to be as deliberative as we can in making these decisions. We have a uh, weekly meeting of the management staff where we review each of these situations carefully. And in addition to that, <clears throat> if the uh, charity comes back to us with feedback and uh, uh, other perspectives, we try to consider that, and also when we post this information, we'll also 
post whatever information they so give So you're not us. just reaching uh, some sort of a verdict in isolation and, and, and setting yourself up as, as judge and jury and potentially uh, executioner. You're, you, you, you find some areas of concern, you bring it back to the nonprofit organization, you hear what they have to say, and at a certain point, as is done throughout the internet, um, you, you have findings that you then report out. Yes, if the, if the organization will even dialogue with us, sometimes we, we, don't, we don't hear back. Um, but the other thing is that in some situations where we continue to agree to disagree, we have to use a pro bono attorney, and sometimes we have to use uh, uh, from our own insurance an attorney because it rises to that level. It has not happened that often. Uh, more often than not, uh, I think the evidence that we point to, we just objectively say, this is what it says in this report, and we, don't, we try not to make judgment statements about it. It's just, here's what we found, and we think donors need to know about this, and it rises to a level of severity. But occasionally it gets to that point, uh, but we try to dialogue throughout from the beginning to the end. Uh, we begin with uh, back and bar back correspondence. If there still is no satisfaction, phone calls, face-to-face uh, -face meetings in some extreme cases, but we try to dialogue. Uh, but it's a, it's a very challenging, but I think critical role. So our role as watchdog is, is fits that very well. And then the other part that our founder calls the guide dog part is also critically important. And then, of course, we, we don't want to be a lap dog. So those are the, that's sort of how we tease it out amongst ourselves where all of this fits, that we want to provide information, point to the wonderful organizations, and also be able to identify those that appear to be having problems. Sometimes these problems are scoundrels and thieves. Sometimes these problems are really incompetence or just not really keeping your eye on the ball. So it can be a combination of those things. And, and I think personally that more often than not, it's without intent, uh, ill intent. The scoundrels and thieves, I think, is a smaller bucket of us than those of us that may not manage that well, as opposed to the many wonderful that are doing great things. But it is, it's a problem, and I don't think it's rare from what we've seen. It's more than rare. It's, it's not medium well, but it's, you know, there's a, it's a little bit bigger than sometimes we try to characterize it. Well, Ken Berger of Charity Navigator, thank you so much for sharing the work of the, uh, of the organization with us, and thank you so much for your insights. And thank you, Mark, and thank you for this venue for being able to talk about it.